My name's Eleanor Catton and my most recent book is called Burnham Wood. It's a literary thriller set in New Zealand in 2017 in a fictional town in the South Island and it follows a group of young activists who call themselves Burnham Wood, having taken the name from Shakespeare's Macbeth, and their encounter with an American billionaire who has come to New Zealand ostensibly to build a bunker in which he will see out the apocalypse. And so the book is about people from very different political persuasions coming together and making choices that impact one another. It's a book that I hope will ask political questions without being itself partisan. I didn't at all want to write a book that um, tried to persuade anybody of anything. I wanted to write a book that gave people a good time, that was thrilling and surprising and bloodthirsty and, um, and, and, and good fun. <laughs> in 2015 I had a residency in Amsterdam and it so happened that right before I got there there had been various student protests and in solidarity with the students who had protested there was a bookstore who was right beneath the flat where I was staying that was just absolutely jam-packed with the most fascinating left-wing literature, kind of pamphlets and manifestos and manuals for protest and so on. And I became really interested in reading my way through the bookshelves of this bookstore and um, came home with a couple of suitcases full of books. But it wasn't really until probably a couple of years later that the characters began to take shape and I came up with a sort of a form for the novel. One of the things that happened in the subsequent years was that I adapted uh, Jane Austen's Emma for film. Over the course of that adaptation, I of course read Emma many times over and over and became very familiar with it as a book. And the more I read this novel of, you know, just exquisite formal perfection and just marveled at, at what Jane Austen had done, the more interested I became in the idea of form and how it can come to shape moral action. That kind of began to obsess me, I suppose, over, over those years. And so it might seem quite strange now when you read the novel to think of Jane Austen as the forebear because in a, in a lot of ways the, the, the books have very little in common but it was out of my reverence for Jane Austen that this book was really born. What's so fascinating to me about Jane Austen is that there is almost no figurative language at all and very, very little descriptive language. Everything is narration. Everything is, is driving forward the consciousnesses of the, of the characters. There's almost no inefficiency to her books either. They're so exquisitely patterned. The ironies are so beautiful and complete and yet you have such a sense that these characters are real and that you know them and that you love them or you hate them and you're so pleased when they get together or when they don't get together and I think that there's something just very ancient about that actually it's very Aristotelian it's very dramatic in the very classical sense and so one of my principal ambitions for Burnham Wood was to ask myself whether I could do what Jane Austen had done for a comic form for a tragic form so rather than ending with everybody getting married my book would take a more tragic direction. Though perhaps that's saying too much. <laughs> One of the ways that Macbeth is a very useful play to us these days in a political sense is how quick we are to diagnose Macbeth-like qualities in our political enemies and how seldom we identify Macbeth-like qualities in ourselves. And so I quite liked the idea of writing a book where depending on your own political sympathies that you bring to the novel, you might think that somebody is more of a Macbeth than somebody else. So you might think, yes, you know, this one character is very ambitious and single-minded, but that's justified. And this other character's ambition and single-mindedness is not justified. I set myself the challenge that I wanted everybody to say something at some point that I agreed with, but I also wanted everybody to be a plausible candidate for the role of Macbeth, which meant that they all had to have darkness in them, they had to have a, a, a capacity to fall, they had to be blind in some way. And so once I got that as a sort of a formal conceit that I w wanted to play with, I started thinking about how to design the book so that each character would have a sort of a, um, a Lady Macbeth figure who played the foil to them in a way, and also a witches-like character who would act as a sort of a tempter on the other side. I think that Macbeth, above all, is a play about the illusion of certainty. It's about what happens when you become so convinced that a, a course of action must be the way that things are going to turn out, that you stop being alive to contingency, you stop seeing all, all of the ways in which you might be wrong. And I think we're all guilty of that. People are guilty of that right across the political spectrum. The other thing that's very interesting about Macbeth is how it treats time and how it treats the future. I can distinctly remember a time, I think it was probably around about uh, 2016 when we had the election of Donald Trump obviously which um, very few people saw coming, the 
uh, Brexit vote here in the United Kingdom. It was a very uncertain time. It was a time when people were questioning their liberal democratic assumptions and the kind of the complacency that had led them to that point. And I can distinctly remember that there was a shift around that time whenever people would talk about the future in a social setting, somebody in the company would say, if the world even exists by then, that point of view would always come up. We're staring down our infinitude as a, as a species, as a planet. And I think that there's something very dangerous about thinking like that. You know, it can become a license to behave however you like, really. But it's also this kind of depression. I mean, it's the kind of depression that Macbeth voices at the end of Macbeth when Lady Macbeth dies and he says, you know, it's just tomorrow and tomorrow, who cares? You know, this is all just a, a tale told by an idiot. He's such a nihilist in that moment. And so I, I was very certain in myself that I didn't want to write a nihilistic book. I didn't want to write a depressing book. I wanted to write a book that excited you because it made you want to know what was going to happen to these characters. If you achieve that as a writer, you're giving the reader a sense of the future. You're making them want to keep reading. And so even for a little, even for, the, for, for a little moment in that, that, that brief time that they're reading your book, they have a reason to live, you know? And I think that there's something quite, quite powerful about that, actually.